It's up to us to allow the kingdom of God to be released in us and through our life. And when we looked at the word of God and we've seen so many things, how Jesus did it, how he started this movement, how he started, and when he started, he created a movement. He created something that was moving with and advancing with dynamic force and power, holy power, pushing back the darkness. And we see this in Matthew chapter 4. And as he began to preach and began to go from town to town and city to city and village to village, households were being impacted, changed, transformed by the kingdom power. Cities were being impacted, changed. Things were happening. It was a movement. It was a movement that continued through 12 men, those 12 men through others. And then later through the church in the book of Acts, they begin to spread across the world and the globe, impacting nations, cities, continents, countries, people's lives of all nations, of all tongues, of all color, of all nationality. This is what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be involved in. This is what the church of Jesus is supposed to be all about. Partnering together with God, Jesus, in advancing the kingdom of God, forcefully advancing the kingdom of God through holy power, forcefully with holy power, and those that are keen enough to recognize that this is a move of God will press into it, will press into it. So we talked about a lot of different things, and we started last week, and we there in Luke, the gospel of Luke chapter 16, where Jesus basically was declaring to us there in Luke 16, that the advancement of the kingdom of God is advanced through preaching and pressing in. Remember that? Preaching and pressing in. The kingdom of God is advanced, forcefully advanced, through preaching and, king, and, and, uh, and pressing in. Now, it shows us then, it communicates, it conveys to us, to the church today, that that, that the kingdom of God must be proclaimed with spiritual passion. Spiritual passion. I, and I, I read to you the points that if VOSB is going to be a part of forcefully advancing the kingdom of God and the vision of, of our church with fresh fire and power for the glory of God, then it must be done with spiritual passion. Secondly, through passionate pursuit of prayer warfare. Thirdly, with expectation of the miraculous, which requires faith. And fourthly, with a burning heart for world evangelism. Now, I rushed through those things to close up the service. But now we're going to go through each one. Are you ready this morning? So first of all, if we're going to be a part of forcefully advancing the kingdom of God through our vision of Victory Outreach International and our local vision, then it must be done with spiritual passion. It must be proclaimed with spiritual passion. You cannot advance this kingdom with dead works. You cannot advance this kingdom with dead words. This is why the message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's inevitable. The kingdom of God is coming. And when the kingdom of God is coming, that means salvation has come. But not only salvation, but judgment. And therefore, we, those that are keen enough, will press into it and be saved. Those that, that criticize, those that sarcastically come against, those of unbelief, listen, they will be judged. And so, so when you talk about advancing with spiritual passion, the passion, what is passion? What is passion? Passion is this, any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling towards someone, place, or thing. Let me say that again. What is passion? Passion is a powerful, compelling emotion or feeling towards someone, place, or thing. What is your passion here this morning? What is your passion? What is it that moves you every day? What drives you every day? What pushes you? What causes you?
causes you to get up every morning out of bed and start your day? What is it that gets you through your day? No matter what happens, uh, good or bad, yet you keep on living and you keep on moving. What is your passion here this morning that keeps you moving, keeps you pushing, keeps you engaging, keeps us advancing? I call it the momentum life. The momentum of life. What is it that drives us? What is the momentum of your life? Yeah. See, because when you got momentum, you got steam. Remember in the old days, those old steam trains, engines, right? You put coal and develop steam, and that's what gave them power, traction to move forward. When you got momentum, you got steam. That means you got power. You got force. That means that whatever gets in your way gets run over. That means that whatever gets in your way gets pushed out of your way. That means that whatever gets in your way, it can't stop you. It won't stop you. Because you got momentum, you got power, you got force. So the question is then, who is the person that gives you that momentum? It should be Jesus Christ. Thank God for your wife. Bless her heart. Thank God for your husband. Thank God for your children. Thank God for your parents. Thank God for your coaches. Thank God for, you know, whoever. But the one that should give us that momentum, that power, that force to get up every morning that moves us, drives us, is Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is our salvation. He's our deliverer. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that died on the cross and shed his blood and took our place, all my sins and your sins, upon him on that tree so that we can be forgiven and have life and life more abundantly. Somebody give God a thank you for that. What should give us passion is Jesus Christ. He's given us life. He's given us hope. He's given us purpose. He's given us a reason to live. Jesus should be that person that drives us. That thing that drives, that thing that, uh, the person that moves us. Heaven should be that place. The scripture in the New Testament always tells us that we have this hope. And it's not the hope that, that is in the world that, that is like of, of uncertainty. Well, I hope things go well or I hope things work out. No, the believer has a lively hope, a hope that is alive. It's a certainty. It's a secured place in heaven. That's what, that's what should motivate us, drive us. The scripture, if you read the scripture in the New Testament, what, they were living for that lively hope. They understood that they're just passing through this earth, that this world is not their home, that their citizenship is heaven. And that's what should drive us. One day... I'm going to be with our loved ones that have gone before. One day we're going to be with Jesus. One day we're going to be in heaven. And there I, therefore I live because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to come back. And he's going to come back for his church. And he's looking for a church without spot or without blemish. And when he comes, one would be in the field. Two would be in the field. One would be taken and one would be left behind. Two would be lying in a bed. One would be taken and one would be left behind. Which one will you be? Remember the parable of the virgins with the, with the oil? The ten virgins, nine, had full oil. One didn't. And when the time of accountability came, come on, could you give me some of your oil? Can you give me some of your oil? Come on, China, give me some of your oil. Please, please, give me some of your oil. Get your own oil, man. This is my security right here. 
This is what my, my guarantee that gets me to that place called heaven. You heard the same word I heard. The, the same gospel was preached to you that was preached to me. All those parables speak to us about working and, and working with passion. With one eye here, but one eye looking towards heaven. But the day that is coming. That's what Jesus, the whole message, was trying to prepare the people. Repent. Turn away. Change your ways. Change your mind. Change your course. Judgment is coming. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can be saved if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the work that he did on the cross for you. It doesn't have to be. All you got to do is receive Christ. And thirdly, our God-given vision. Our God-given vision or mission in life should be that driving force, that passion that drives us, moves us, get us up every day, gets us moving every day. We can't wait to get to church. We can't wait to come and serve. We can't wait to, to set up tables. We can't wait to do the. If it's a drag something, you got, you got no oil. If coming to church and serving God and, 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 and ministering to people and, and doing things uh, and service to help so other people can be blessed, if it's a bummer, if it's a drag to you, you got no oil. That tells you you're, you're, you're low on oil. Because the Bible says there should be joy in the ministry. John 14 talks about abiding in the vine. He that abides in the vine will be fruitful. Right? Life should flow out of you. And when there's life, there's joy. Unspeakable, so full of glory. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Right? And it's joy serving. There's a joy. And you can see those that have a lot of oil. They go around, they serve, they're always excited. They, it's like, and they're sweating and it's hard. And, oh, my, oh, but they're still serving with joy. They, they have oil, they got a full tank. Because they're passionate. They're passionate. Our God given vision should give us passion. To give us momentum, power, fire, because it gives us a sense of purpose. Remember when you had no purpose? Remember when you woke up in the morning, man, you didn't want to get up. For what? The same old, same old? Oh, my empty life. Right? Not all, but, but a good majority. And then there's some that you had purpose. You had this and that, but it was... Now, God wants to change that purpose to what really matters. But what shall it gain, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but in the end lose his own soul? See, Jesus always put things back into perspective. Oh, you want to be great? You want to be great? You want to be first? Right? And he never rebuked that basic instinct in a man or a person for wanting to be great. Some people might condemn you. Oh, that's the wrong motive. Jesus never did. But rather, he, he put it, he redefined what greatness really was all about. Amen? And he put it in his proper priority and place. Oh, you want to be great? Then be the greatest servant of all. That means anybody can be great in this world. And anybody can be great in this kingdom as long as you're willing to humble yourself and serve God and serve people. Oh, you want to be first? Yeah, I want to be first. I like to be first. Everybody likes to be first. Nobody likes to be at the end of the line. Oh, you want to be first. Nothing wrong with wanting to be first. Be the first to love. Be the first to forgive. Be the first to show mercy. Be the first to show justice and righteousness. He just, he didn't rebuke it. He just redefined it. Put it in its proper priority so that anyone can be great in the kingdom. See, so when you talk about momentum, what gets us up and what gets us moving that nothing and nobody can stop us or, 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 or cause us to quit 
Amen. That momentum should come from Jesus Christ. That passion should come from Jesus Christ. Heaven is our goal. And our God-given vision and mission in life is what should drive us every day, every moment. That is what has lasting, eternal benefits. So we need to put it in perspective. So our God-given vision, Victory Outreach, is the vehicle that God uses in which we do our part in the advancement and the establishment of the kingdom of God all over the world. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach this gospel to every nation. Make disciples of every nation, right? And we believe in, that's why we're raising money, but that's why we send people to the world, missionaries. But we also have a, a, a vision, a house vision, a movement vision, a local vision. And our vision, local vision, global vision is the vehicle that God uses in which we, Victory Outreach, do our part in partnering together with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in the establishment and advancement of the kingdom all over the world. Our vision is to plant churches, Victory Homes, UTCs, in every strategic and inner city around the world. That's our global vision. Our local vision is to establish a base church here in San Bernardino. And the vision strategy is through the life groups, the small groups, all over, planted all over the greater Inland Empire, right? As well as having a powerful, dynamic celebration service where people come from all over the Inland Empire, not just to another church service, but they come into an encounter. They come into an experience with Jesus Christ. That's what we want. That's our goal. That should be our passion. And the undergirding rebar, if you will, that holds everything together that will strengthen and support, support everything we do is prayer. Did you hear me? It's prayer. That's why our prayer movement is one of our core ministries. If we don't have that, then we're just busy for God with activity and events, but we don't want to just be busy. We want to see transformation. We want to see the miraculous. We want to see, you know, souls saved. We want to see lives restored. We want to see the devil cast out so that people can move forward and accomplish God's purpose in their life. Amen? Are you with me here today? Passionate pursuit of prayer warfare. And we'll talk about that later. But that's what, the word pas that, that's what the word passionate means. Now, how many know some people, and I think it's happened to all of us, at one time or another has lost their passion. At one time or another at this journey with God, maybe at one, we, one time we were on fire, we were moving, we were jamming with God, we were serving and Things happen in life. Things happen in church. Things happen with relationships. Things happen, you know, in, 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 in the world. Right? Circumstances, trials of life, tribulations of life, the difficulties of life, things happen. Amen? And all those things the devil will use to try and put out your fire. Try and rob you of your passion. That's why I've always said, you hear me preach all the time, don't ever let the devil take your song. Right? Don't ever let them take your song. You keep on singing. You keep on praising. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter how dark of a moment you're going through, what valley you're in, listen, you keep on singing. You keep on praising. Don't let the devil take your song. Because if the devil takes your song, that means that he's taking your joy. And if he's taking your joy, then he's taking your strength. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if he takes your strength, he takes your destiny. Now he neutralized you. Now he got you to settle. Now you're not being as effective as you used to be. Now you're, you're, not, you're, not, being, uh, uh, you're not advancing the kingdom. You're not uh, uh, forcefully engaging uh, amen, any longer. Now he's neutralized you. 
Now he's got you where he wants you. And the world will co-sign with you. Family members will co-sign with you. Loved ones will co-sign with you. Huh? Your bosses will co-sign with you. The people of your world will co-sign with you. Your teachers, your coaches, your counselor will co-sign with you. Oh, it's all right. You don't have to be so fanatical. You don't have to be so religious. You know, come on, you know. I'm a Christian. I serve God. But what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they really doing for the kingdom? See, and that's the way the enemy works. And so we've all been there. We've all experienced it. And this is why some of us, and many times at this time, this journey of ours, we have to get ignited again. Somewhere along the line, we can't allow ourselves to get saved and stuck. We can't allow ourselves to settle. Don't settle for that sin. Like you heard in the, in the video, don't settle for that sickness. Don't settle oh, for that infirmity. Don't settle for that situation. Don't settle for where you are. Don't settle that the job don't want to release you or change your hours so you can be in church. And do, don't settle for that. If you're a believer, if you're a true believer of Jesus Christ, if you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ, let me tell you something. You won't settle. But you will pray and pray and fast until God moves and changes your hour so you can do what God has called you to do. And if he doesn't do it, then maybe, just maybe God has another job for you. But you're stuck. Oh, but I like this job. Then you like that job more than you like Jesus. Okay, all right. Well. Let's be real. Let's not sugarcoat anything here. I got a response. One day I got to stand before God for all of you. Amen. <laughs> so some of us need to be ignited again. And so God uses certain things, just like he used those things in life to, to neutralize. He'll use certain things to try and ignite you. Try and spark, get a little spark again. And some of you, that's all you need is a little spark. Huh? Just a little spark and man, you're on again. Huh? You're on. There's a little, little healing right there. Oh, you're on now. Look out. Huh? Just a little breakthrough and that's it. That's done, man. I'm ready. Some of you just need that little spark, man. I know it because they're called. You're called. I know some of you. And some of you new ones, man. Listen, let me tell you something. There's nothing, you know, more worth living for than Christ and his purpose and his mission in life. Because all this is going to pass away. He said, well, yeah, but is that really true? Or is that just a fantasy? You know, I had this, you know, well, you'll find out. I like that story of that little girl that was, you know, in, the, in school, didn't, this, talking to her teacher, having a conversation with her te teacher, see if I can remember it, but, and she was telling the teacher, I said, you know, something about heaven, and she says, I can't wait to when I get to heaven, you know, and, and find out about this and this and this, and the teacher, well, how do you know that there is even a heaven, you know, and uh, how, you know, if you get to how you're going to, you know, if you go, you know, well, you know, how are you going to know or something like this? And he says, what if, what if you don't, you know, what if it's, uh, how does she say it? something about, you know, if you don't get to heaven or something about heaven? And he says, well, you know, what if, what if you're, you don't go to heaven? What if you go down there? And then the little girl looks at her teacher and says, well, then you could find out for me. So Pastor Rick's preaching heaven, we'll see. I'd rather be there and find out than not be there at all. Passion. So some of us need to be ignited. So what, 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 what's some of the things? I know some of the things that could ignite is this, because I know who I'm talking to. And you, this is what usually ignites me. And that is the urgency. The urgency of the need that is around us. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus 
communicates and uses this whole scene with his disciples to communicate to them the urgency of his mission. Because that's why he called them, say, called them to follow him. Because they were going to be ones that he was going to work with. He was going to pour himself into, teach them, train them. That when he left this earth to carry on his mission. And so in John chapter 9 verse 1, Jesus is walking with his disciples. And then the Bible says that they seen a blind man begging on the side of the road. And I don't know what motives the disciples had or what. Maybe they were sincere in their question, but they stopped Jesus. Said, Jesus, wait, and look at this blind man. Who sinned? This blind man that he was born this way or his parents? And then Jesus, you know, turned around and said, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God, the glory of God would be revealed in this man. That God's character God who God is will be revealed not only to you but to this generation in other words you're going to see the miraculous glory power of God manifest in this man's life because you asked this question you're going to see God's love in action you're going to see God's compassion in action you're going to see God's power in action that even though he was born blind and it had been unheard of up to this generation that nobody ever born blind could ever see I'm going to show you what I'm able to do for my honor and my father's glory but then he said this, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in this world, this is what I live for. This is what I was born for. Somebody say amen. amen. In other words, you hear the urgency. He's communicating to these signs, but he says, look, as long as I'm here on earth, as long as I have breath, I'm going to fulfill my father's business. I'm going to do what my God, the father, created me and sent me here to do. And other times he said, I come to seek and to save those that are lost. Another time his disciples uh, had left to go get food to eat. And while they were gone, he was talking to a Samaritan woman. And they had this whole conversation. He was impacting her life. And when they came back, they seen him talking, but they didn't want to say nothing. And so Jesus then, you know, oh, they asked Jesus, Jesus, listen, eat, eat. You know, you've been busy. You've been ministering. You're tired. Eat, eat. He's, you know, what did he say? He turned and he said, look, my meat is to do the will of my father. He says, I have food that you not, know not of. He says, my meat is to do the will of the father. That was Jesus' life. That was his passion. That's who he was. That's how he thought. That's how he lived. That's how he talked. And listen to, listen to me. The church is the body of Christ. The church is to be like Christ. If that was his mentality, if that was his lifestyle, if that was his passion, how much more should it be you and I, the church? In other words, he's communicating an urgency. An urgency. Oh, I wish I had more time. But we have next Sunday. <laughs> and we'll pick up from there, the urgency. Because some of us need to be reminded why God saved us. Why, why did God put us all back together again? Why did God restore our families? Why, why aren't some of us dead right now? Why are we in prison? Why, why, why are we in church now? Why, why has God blessed us? You know, why, why, do, why does people respect us now? Why, why do they come to and look to us now for answers? Those that hated us, now God makes them love us or shows us favor. Why? Not just so that we can live life but that we would be on his mission fulfilling his mission advancing the kingdom forcefully advancing the kingdom of God with such holy power pushing back the darkness so that some of our loved ones and friends and relatives and people that we know well we recognize that man there has to be a God and want to press in with us 
Because people are hurting, man. People are hurting. All, this week, we were in business, the business part of ministry. Reorganization. But man, in the midst of that, people are still in need. I get the call. This, this one's at the hospital, or this one's in need, or this one here. And then people just come to the church with needs. And you can never be too busy for a human being, a person that is in need. And in the midst of that, you got to minister. Not because you have to, because that's what Jesus would do. That's who we are. That's who we are, Victory Outreach. And let's never forget that. We come to church, and we have great church, good experience, but we come to see people healed, see people set free, delivered. People get breakthroughs so they can go out of here and advance the kingdom. Not just go back home and cut your grass and water your own, but to advance the kingdom of God. Every head bowed and every eye. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Jesus. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please, only the worship team or the ushers moving around at this time. There are people in need. Even in our church, people in need. Perhaps even right now, sitting in this church, you're invited by a friend or neighbor, relative, or somehow the Spirit of God directed you here. And you're not saved. You're not born again. You have not experienced that, that kind of power, that kind of love in your life. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, please, and you're sitting here and you're hurting inside. There's turmoil going on within there's an agony, a desperation. That woman that came looking for her daughter, her daughter had been missing, trying to find her. Desperation. You can see the picture of desperation. We've done, and we're still trying to do everything we can to try and help her. Maybe that you're here today and you're facing some things and situations in your life. Looks hopeless. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that you came to the right place. Because Jesus Christ is Lord in this church. And we look to him as our healer, our salvation, our deliverer. He's done it for us. And if you knew our story, it would blow your mind. But if he can do it for us, he can do it for you. So I want to pray for some folks here today. I want to pray for some individuals, men, women, maybe teenagers, even a child. And say, Pastor... I need God in my life. If God can help me, if Jesus can help me, if he can change me, then I'm ready to receive him, ask him to come into my heart. If that's you here today, as every head is bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, simply by the raising of your hand, I'm going to acknowledge you and I want to pray for you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you. It's your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? I need God in my life. I need a miracle. We serve a miracle worker. God bless you. God bless you. This is a moment you can feel the Holy Spirit here. God bless you, sir. God is here. God bless you, ma'am. God is here. He loves you. God bless you. It's your hand in the back. This is what I'm asking you to do. We're going to stand in just a moment. All of you that raised your hand, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you to Jesus, your hope, your salvation, your strength, your freedom, your deliverance, your healing. I want to pray for you. So I want you to stand with me. Church. Stand with me now. Stand all over this place. 